Author Sheila Walsh tells of putting on a show with her three-year-old son, Christian. Christian wanted to act out uh, Jesus riding into Jerusalem on the donkey. And he declared that he would be Jesus and his mother, Sheila, would be Hosanna. And Sheila asked, well, who's Hosanna? Well, the donkey, of course. Why else would the crowds be yelling Hosanna when Jesus rode through the streets? And Sheila wondered to herself, if the crowds understood the word Hosanna any better than her three-year-old son did, or just a week later, these same citizens were calling for Jesus' crucifixion. Well, welcome to this Passion and Palm Sunday. This is a day for celebrating Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem, as well as his passion, his suffering, and, and death for the sins of the world. The focus of the sermon for today is not upon the triumphant entry. It is on the, the rest of Jesus last week with his disciples. It's upon Christ's passion, his suffering, beginning with Judas's betrayal and Peter's denial and the grim reality of death by crucifixion. But today I'd like to focus specifically on Judas's betrayal. You know the story probably all too well. We pick up the story with Matthew 26, 14. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, What are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? So they counted out for him thirty silver coins. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Is this why Judas betrayed Jesus? 30 silver coins? Now, if that were true, then Judas didn't drive a very hard bargain, that's for sure. Because, you see, 30 silver coins were only worth about $21.60. Hardly enough for a meal in a good restaurant. Surely there must be more. There must be more to Judas's betrayal of Jesus. More than just the money. The next scene... In the Passion narrative, shifts to a house where Jesus and his disciples are celebrating the Passover together. While they're eating, Jesus, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. Well, that's quite a bombshell to drop on the disciples. One of you will betray me? The disciples were very sad. And they began to say to him one after the other, Surely not I, Lord. Surely not I, Lord. Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas said, Surely not I, Rabbi. Jesus answered, yes, it is you. This is important. When Jesus announced that one of his disciples would betray him, all the disciples asked, surely not I, Lord. Judas is the last one to speak, and notice what he says, surely not I, Rabbi. While the other 11 disciples called Jesus Lord, Judas referred to him in this account only as teacher. There is certainly a difference between thinking of Jesus as Lord and thinking of him as just another good teacher. Maybe we have a clue here, a clue to Judas' betrayal. The next scene that is relevant to the theme for today takes place in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus has been praying in agony to his father, and meanwhile his disciples are sleeping. Jesus Christ in agony over the state of the world, and meanwhile we sleep. Jesus returns to his disciples and he says to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come. 
And the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. And while he is speaking, Judas arrives. With him a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Judas has arranged a signal. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas says, Greetings, Rabbi, and kisses him. Notice he is still calling Jesus Rabbi. And then the infamous kiss, the kiss of betrayal, the kiss of treachery, the kiss of death. You know, in many cultures, it is not unusual for men to greet one another with a kiss on the cheek. In Greek and Roman society, people did not exchange kisses in public places in biblical times because it was a family greeting reserved for the home. In Jewish society, however, it seems to have been part of the expectation for house guests. You may remember that Jesus, Jesus criticized Simon the Pharisee for not offering him this courtesy at a, at a, a dinner party at Simon's house. That's in Luke 40, 745. Early followers of Jesus continued this practice of greeting fellow Christians with a kiss. That's in Romans 16, 16 and 1 Peter 5, 14. A kiss from a disciple to a rabbi would simply be a sign of respect. So Judas's kiss would not have made the other disciples suspicious when it happened. That kiss has become notorious, however, because a sign of affection, a sign of honor was given with completely opposite intentions as a mark of identity for execution. Such a dichotomy scorned the, the friendship that Jesus offered his disciples. It was a betrayal. It was a betrayal which sentenced Jesus to be captured by his enemies, and Judas must have realized that it was highly likely to lead to, an almost, to a most violent, violent death. Judas kissed Jesus on the cheek in order to betray him. Jesus replies, Friend, do what you came for. Judas is betraying Jesus, and Jesus calls him friend. Turn around, Judas. There's still time. Jesus loves you. You don't have to make this terrible mistake. At the beginning of chapter 27 of Matthew's Gospel, we read early in the morning all the chief priests and the elders of the people came to the decision to put Jesus to death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse. And he returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied. That's your problem. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. And then he went away and hanged himself. That is a tragic, sad story. And of course, the eternal question is, why did he do it? Why did he do it? Judas's name may be instructive here. Judas Iscariot. Judas is the Greek form of the common name Judah. What Iscariot signifies is unclear. Usually, it would signify where he's from. For example, Mary Magdalene was Mary from Magdala. However, no territory named Iscaria has ever existed. Now, the spell check function on my computer suggested that I replace Judas Iscariot with Judas Escargo, <laughs> which would be Judas the Snail, which obviously is not correct. Some biblical scholars suggest that the name Iscariot may refer to a fanatical group of people known as the Sicarii. 
That is, dagger bearers. They were a sort of a terrorist organization. Their aim was to overthrow the Roman occupation of Israel and restore power to the Jews. They believed that the Messiah would lead them to freedom by force. The triumphal entry on Palm Sunday must have kindled their hopes. The crowd was eating out of Jesus' hand. He could easily have seized power. His refusal to act may have made them angry. Judas didn't give up hope, however. When he betrayed Jesus, he may have hoped to, to, to back him into a corner from which the only way out was to fight and so begin the battle of the Sicarii longed for. The truth is that we simply cannot know for certain what moved Judas to betray Jesus. Of course, there are those who believe that because it was prophesied that the Messiah would be betrayed, that Judas had no choice. I don't quite buy that. But there are some things that we can say for sure about Judas. First of all, Judas made a bad choice. I don't think I'll get too much argument about that one. Judas betrayed the Son of God. It doesn't get any worse than that. Anyone here ever make a bad choice? Are any of you married to someone who has made a bad choice? <laughs> have, are, have any of you ever parented anyone who's made a bad choice? Or maybe I should say, have any of you ever made a bad choice? We are all sinners, saved by the grace of God. Judas made a bad choice. And he paid for his bad choice. He paid, he paid as few people have ever paid for a bad choice. Has anyone here ever met a person in your whole life named Judas? I mean, Adolf Hitler was perhaps the, the, the most vile, twisted person who ever lived. But people still name their son Adolf. Right? But Judas? I doubt that any mother would name her son Judas. Judas is the most disgraced person in human history. His name is synonymous with betrayal. Recently, I read about a goat they kept uh, at a company called the New York Butcher's Dressed Meat Company. They called this animal the Judas Goat. Interesting name, isn't it? The Judas Goat. The Judas Goat would start work at 7 o'clock every morning, leading sheep from the unloading pens, from the unloading uh, pens on the docks on the riverfront there, to the slaughterhouse. And there the unsuspecting creatures were killed and dressed out. The goat made eight to ten trips a day, leading two to three hundred ewes and lambs each time. It is estimated that this Judas goat became an accessory to the death of about four and a half million sheep. The reason the company employed a Judas goat is that sheep, unlike cattle and hogs, cannot be driven. They will follow a leader, however, especially if the leader looks like them. Because this Judas goat was handsome, bright, and commanding in appearance, the sheep eagerly trailed after him only to meet their doom. Ah, Judas is the most infamous name in human history. Judas made a bad choice, and he paid for that bad choice, just as you and I pay for our bad choices. Sometimes a bad choice will cost us money. Sometimes it will cost us our reputation. Every once in a while, someone will make a bad choice that will cost them their family. And yes, sometimes a bad choice will even cost you your life. We ought to consider very carefully the choices we make. Some of them can be very, very costly. Judas could have made amends for his bad choice. Instead, he compounded his mistake by taking his own life. When Judas realized that what he had done by betraying Jesus, he tries to undo it, but by then it's too late. And then rather than seeking Christ's forgiveness, he hangs himself. You know, it didn't have to be that way. 
It didn't have to end up like that. This is so important. People make bad choices, and then they compound those bad choices by making more bad choices. They refuse to ask for forgiveness from those they have hurt. They shut out themselves off from those who, who love them. And sometimes they keep making the same bad mistake for so long that it becomes to define who they are. And then it's almost impossible to turn back. But it doesn't have to be that way. Because you see, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ came to reach out to people who make bad choices. That's the whole purpose. That's the whole reason that Jesus came to our world. In Mark 2.17, Jesus says to his followers, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous. I have come for sinners. There is a display in New York's Museum of Jewish Heritage. In this display are casts of some leather gloves. They're gloves that Israeli agent Peter Malkin wore when he grabbed Nazi Adolf Eichmann as he walked home from his bus stop in Buenos Aires on May 11th, 1960. Eichmann was the man who organized the transport and death of six million Jews during the death camps of World War II. He was the one who first coined the phrase, final solution. Malkin wore gloves when he arrested Eichmann because he could not bear to touch such a man. He admits he had no second thoughts, no second thoughts about the righteousness of his mission or about Eichmann's death. He just didn't want to touch such a despicable man. If, after Christ's resurrection, Judas had approached the risen Lord and asked for forgiveness, Jesus would have reached out to him, not with gloves on his hands. He would have reached out to him with nail-pierced hands, hands that were pierced for Judas himself. Do you hear what I'm saying? So many people carry around the heavy baggage of guilt and regret. And what's worse, they make additional choices that only increase their feelings of unworthiness. It doesn't have to be that way. Jesus Christ reaches out to you just as he reaches out to me with his nail-pierced hands of love and forgiveness. An agnostic friend of mine, a very skeptical agnostic guy, once asked me, how do you account for the fact that Jesus chose Judas to be one of his disciples? How do you account for that? I told him I had a bigger problem than that. I don't understand why Jesus told, chose Judas to be one of his disciples. But a bigger problem for me is why did Jesus choose John O'Neill? That is the question, isn't it? Judas' story is our story. We all make bad choices. And what it comes down to is, what do you believe about God? What do you believe about God? You know, every once in a while, we come across a collection of letters that children have written to God. And some of these letters contain real wisdom and insight. Dear God, writes Jennifer, do you really hurt people who don't believe in you? If I were you, I would love them anyway. My mommy tells me that people who do not believe in you do not know any better. Why don't you teach them to know you better? You are God. Love, Jennifer. Or this one. Dear God, 
Is there anything that you cannot do if you make up your mind? I change my mind all the time. Do you change yours? My Uncle George died because he drank too much. I liked him because he read to me. Please change your mind about Uncle George. Love, Bobby. <laughs> Sounds like Uncle George made a bad choice. Maybe a lot of bad choices. But don't worry, Bobby. Jesus Christ went through great suffering and pain to show his love for people who make bad choices just like Uncle George and just like you and me. And you see, that's the only hope that any of us have. Thanks for watching. I hope this video can further the discussion of your relationship with Christ, either at home or maybe in the comments below.